This is His Mind Report. I'm Paul Bloom. I'm a professor of psychology and cognitive science at Yale University, and I'm delighted to be talking today to Steve Pinker. Hi, Steve. Hi, Paul. Um, just to get your, your title correct, you are the Harvard College professor and Johnstone Family Professor in the Department of Psychology at Harvard University. Um, we've known each other for over 25 years. I, I should tell people I, that you were my uh, one of my advisors, one of my teachers in graduate school. You and I wrote the first paper I've ever published together on evolution of language. And um, I've long been influenced by both your science and your writing over, over my entire career. So this is just a thrill to be talking to you today. Um, I want to start by talking about your recent book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, which is, uh, I think, a very important and very rich and influential book. And um, you make two sorts of claims in the book. One is a descriptive claim about a phenomena. And then the second is a theoretical claim or set of claims about how to explain the phenomena. So I thought maybe we could break things up into two. And I could have you start by just uh, saying what your descriptive claim in the book is. The descriptive claim is that violence has declined over the course of history at a variety of scales of time and of magnitude. And I divide the, uh, the, the empirical phenomenon into uh, six phenomena, uh, each corresponding to a different kind of uh, decline. And they include the decline of um, homicide in Western societies by a factor of about 35 since the Middle Ages, the abolition of uh, barbaric institutions like slavery and torture executions, and um, uh, witch hunts and burning heretics at the stake, which were, were concentrated more or less around the time of the European Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. The uh, f more recent decline of uh, war, particularly uh, interstate wars, wars with the government on each side, uh, traditionally the wars that did the most damage, starting around uh, at the end of World War II in 1945. Uh, another decline in war, more uneven and affecting not just the big rich countries, but uh, all countries, uh, starting around the end of the Cold War in 1991. And then finally, the um, abolition, or at least the targeting of violence on smaller scales against vulnerable populations like women, children, racial minorities, uh, even animals. Mm -hmm. Uh, then the the, uh, the the second part of the enterprise is to try to make sense of it all. That is, yeah. why did violence decline on so many scales of time and magnitude? Uh, it just seems uncanny. And I don't think it's that human nature has literally changed in the biological sense of a uh, change in gene frequencies over time. Uh -huh. I think we're pretty much the same species that we were uh, a thousand years ago. So, so um, let's, let's hold back on the theoretical claim and just zoom in oh, yes, okay. on the descriptive one to start with. Um, and and it's, so the first thing I'm, I'm interested in doing is sort of aligning this with the rest of your theoretical views. I was, um, I was reading a blog recently, Crooked Timber, where they had a discussion uh, right before your book came out. And people were sort of astonished that you wrote this book because the descriptive claim is a claim about change and you're well known for your advocacy of evolutionary psychology, the view which I share, which is that our, we have these human natures that were shaped by our evolutionary history. And so there's a sense in which it's a strange book for you to write. Now, now they don't literally clash, the idea that there's change over history and that there's a, a human nature. Um, and in fact, in your earlier books in evolutionary psych, you talk a little bit about this decline of violence. You sort of anticipate this book. But it does seem like an interestingly different direction, a different sort of emphasis, and I'm wondering whether you thought of it that way as you wrote it. Yes, there was a well, there was a, a tension in the earlier books in which I briefly brought up the decline of violence in, in how the mind works and in the blank slate. And one of the reasons I brought it up in those books is that, as as someone who advocates the very idea of a human nature, I, I met with resistance to the very idea, mm -hmm. partly from moral and uh, political motives. Namely, if uh, humans have a nature, including all those nasty bits like dominance and revenge and exploitation and so on, does that mean that we're doomed to perpetual uh, strife and conflict? And uh, does it imply that there's no point in trying to make the world a better place because people will screw it up no matter what you do? Yeah. Uh, and so it seems like a kind of you know, reactionary, anti-progressive uh, position. And I, I think that, at least in part, some of the opposition to 
evolutionary psychology and other more or less nativist approaches mm -hmm. to, to the human mind uh, ha have some of that in it. In it. And some, sometimes it's quite explicit. And what I brought up in those earlier books so that, that this was um, this fear is unfounded. Uh, first of all, it's unfounded because of what uh, an evolutionary approach to human nature actually consists of, which is not that uh, that, that um, behavior itself is selected for, so that there's uh, you know, aggression, aggressive behaviors right. in the genes, uh, but rather certain uh, emotions, drives, ways of of uh, learning and knowing. Um, th those are our legacies for, uh, for evolution, and they don't directly translate into behavior. And that's the psychology part of evolutionary psychology. Namely, uh, it isn't behavior that's selected. Evolution can't actually pull the muscles directly, but it left its stamp on the, the wiring and chemistry of the brain, which gives us certain inclinations, which may or may not um, be externalized as behavior. And the reason that they aren't necessarily externalized is that the mind is a, a complicated place there. Even if we do uh, harbor uh, aggressive impulses, it's not the only thing that, that fits inside the skull. We also have faculties that can inhibit uh, our violent tendencies, like self-control, like empathy, uh, like, uh, like reason. And what we actually do physically depends on which of these faculties uh, gets the upper hand. So it's um, two of the, the, our, the convictions that both you and I have in cognitive science, namely uh, that one must take a cognitive approach, we're not behaviorists, we do believe that, that, uh, that, that, that there, there's contents to the mind, and a, a kind of modular or faculty or specialization approach, namely the mind doesn't consist of one thing, but a number of sometimes competing faculties. Both of those furnish the psychology that lies uh, behind better angels of our nature. And in fact, the, the title itself, which uh, comes from Abraham Lincoln, is a, a pretty direct acknowledgement of a, of a faculty psychology using the, the poetic biblical term mm -hmm. angels, but to refer to one particular or, or one set of faculties in the mind, but not the only ones. You, you can imagine taking that in directions other than violence. So, for instance, there's a lot of evolutionary psychology work on sexual desire and the difference between sexual desire and sexual activity for men and women, what men and women are interested in, and so on. And you can imagine then making the same argument for that, saying, look, this, there's an evolutionary history, but then again, we're modular creatures, we have separate faculties, and that too could change. Um, I mean, how far would you push it? Could you, could you, are there things that we, would never be able to rebel against? Are, are there aspects of human nature that, unlike violence, aren't going to change? Um, I, I think that there are aspects of our mental lives that are not going to change, but our behavior can change you know, a fair amount within those boundaries. It, it's interesting you brought up sexuality because around the time that uh, you and I were working on our paper on language, a uh, visitor to Cambridge was Donald Simons the book Evolution of Human Sexuality, which had the, uh, a, quite a brilliant uh, introductory chapter. This was, his book was written in, in 1979, and it challenged the main idea of the sociobiology of the time, that right. evolution could illuminate behavior. And he said, behavior is it's all over the place. The anthropologists are right that if you go from society to society, all kinds of strange things can happen. Where you really want to go to find universals is in emotion and in desires and in mental life. And, uh, and he argued that sexuality was a, itself was a prime example of that, that while sexual mores and customs might vary, sexual desire might vary a, a whole lot less. And I remember my own kind of touchstone for this was our, our uh, um, President Jimmy Carter at the time, who uh, confessed to Playboy magazine that he committed adultery in his heart many times. <laughs> Uh, almost cost him the presidency. Uh, as far as we know, he never committed it in the flesh. Um, but the fact that as this, this Sunday school teacher, this moralistic, you know, preachy kind of guy, nonetheless had the same mental life as various uh, sleazes who acted on it, uh, I, I think vindicates Simon's on sexuality and, and does have a spillover to violence. In fact, I mentioned one in the book, which is that um, if you try to manipulate people's uh, 
uh, powers of self-control by fatiguing it, as Roy Baumeister would put it, then uh, you get people, at least in their imaginations, being much less uh, inhibited, both in terms of what they think they would do sexually and what they would do uh, in terms of committing violence uh, than if they're in full control of themselves. So it's almost as if, if you could somehow nullify uh, self-control, you'd get much closer to our right. uh, our natures than if you just let people do their own thing. I mean, you can make an, another case would be food, uh, which actually connects to violence in different ways. But uh, I guess the argument would be we're never really going to lose our taste for meat. Uh, you, you can, um, and, you know, unless we redesign our genes or something. However. Uh, we might choose uh, not to eat it or choose to eat certain sorts of meat. We might choose to change our eating habits um, in accord with our sort of better angels, um, though the desires themselves won't change substantially. Yes, as we've done already, uh, even those of us who aren't vegetarians still avoid all kinds of uh, foods that we perceive as, as unhealthy. And, and, that, and it can feed back into certain um, emotions and, and drives if there are, say, critical periods in which we um, fine-tune our tastes for, for foods, for example. If you withhold a certain food from children during that critical period, that might be a way of, and do so for moral uh, or, or self-control reasons, that might um, cause some longer-term retuning of the tastes. Right. It's in, I've always been interested in what you call self-binding, which is changing your environment in the future to sort of block certain possibilities, like um, when you... Um, when, when you set a timer that you can't use the internet for some period of time. And it's interesting the extent to which we could use uh, some sort of techniques to block our own desires. If there was a way, for instance, since I am, um, I'm actually been convinced that most meat eating is immoral, but it's nonetheless I eat it. If there's a way for me to like meat less, I would choose that option. <laughs> yes, um, right. So, yeah. I know, I, I, at, least we, at least you and I both have the exalted moral status of thinking that we ought not to eat meat, even if we yeah. do. I'm sure uh, that's very reassuring to the animals. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but yes, this is, I mean, sometimes called uh, Ulyssian or Odyssean self-control yes. after the, the great story of, of um, uh, Odysseus having himself tied to the mast so he could resist the siren's songs. That's one of the ways in which one part of the brain can outsmart the other. And yet another illustration of, of why, you know, you and I agree that uh, some kind of modular understanding of, uh, of cognition is essential to understanding human behavior. Of course, it's complicated because I have a, a, a program on my computer called Freedom, and I type in a certain amount of time, and during that time, it shuts off my internet. But oh. it, can't, it, can't, it can't stop me, though, from running to my iPad and checking my email. <laughs> right. and, it, and it, also, it also can't make me use the machine in the first place. So, so I, I, I actually need a, a meta program that forces me to consider <laughs> ways of using that program. Um, so, so, so to go back, you, you pointed out that in some way the idea of an invariant human nature is, is unpopular. But one thing I've discovered, and I'm certain you've discovered too, is um, for many people the idea of the changes that you're talking about, where it's just a decline of violence over time, is seen as dist it seems surprising. Many people are just kind of stunned to hear that the last century was not the bloodiest century of all human history. That things are not the worst now than they the worst that they've ever been, but also maybe morally troubling. And, mm -hmm. and I wonder if you have sort of a diagnosis as to why that's so. Yes, and and uh, it's again we as psychologists we get to kind of go meta and uh, uh, try to understand the reason for uh, particular belief systems. Certainly in the case of people not appreciating how much violence has declined, I think that uh, Tversky and Kahneman's exploration of uh, the availability bias, namely we judge risk by how easy it is to recall examples, particularly vivid, gory examples that lodge in memory. And uh, as long as the rate of violence worldwide has not fallen to zero, and it probably never will fall to zero, mm -hmm. Because news is about stuff that happens, not stuff that doesn't happen, there are always going to be enough examples to fill the evening news. And if you get your sense of the risk of the, of the world from the, the news, you're going to think that violence is uh, as, as prevalent as ever. In fact, more prevalent because now yeah. anyone with a cell phone is an instant reporter. They can beam color video footage all over the world pretty much in real time. 
So we're better and better at detecting the violence that occurs. In the past, it may have been a tree falling in the forest with no one to hear it. Uh, but now it's, it's, uh, you can't avoid it. And I think that does distort people's uh, sense. It's only when you look at um, statistics that, that have a denominator, namely how many countries right. are not at war, uh, how many people don't get killed, that you can spot the, uh, the huge decline that's taken place. And there's also a, a bit of our moral psychology that I think uh, gets in, engaged, and, and uh, you're more and more you've been uh, exploring our moral psychology. But I, there, there is a, a, a component of it that if you are um, burnishing your moral credentials, if you're a moral entrepreneur, then uh, you're, you're almost forced to say that we're in a crisis, that, that imminent action is necessary to prevent uh, even a greater crisis. And it's uh, almost as if you say, if you say things are getting better, you, you, there's a worry that you'll lull people into complacency. Uh, yeah. Who's going to join your crusade if you say, well, things have been getting you know, better by themselves? Uh, and so I think there's pressure to shut up about good news, lest you scare away potential supporters. So the flip side of complacency is, I guess, fatalism, where if you think that, uh, say, the situation in Africa is horrible, has always been horrible, if anything, it's getting worse, you might say, look, there's no point in doing anything. You know, the, some version of the poor will always be with us. And to some extent, hearing that changes are happening and good changes are happening can, from a moral entrepreneur standpoint, motivate people to help because they realize that actually help, you know, can happen. Um, if, if And so... You sort of have to, from if you were forgetting about the truth for a moment and talking about what news you'd give to most inspire moral action, you wouldn't say the problem is solved, but at the same time, you might say, look, there's been some improvement and we can continue along those lines. Uh, exactly. No, I, I think that, that is a, a profoundly important point. I completely agree. Let me, um, so, so actually I want to ask you, so you, you make a lot of claims about the decline of violence across very, very different domains. Um, and, um, and there's a couple of ones I wanted to press you on, but I wanted to ask you, what do you feel, of all the claims in your book, what do you feel is sort of the, the, the strongest? I mean, I, I would guess it might be homicide because that's, there the data is, is sort of most direct. What do you think is the strongest? And then what, do you, what are you sort of most tentative about? What do you sort of say you might be proven wrong about? Yeah, uh, certainly, yeah, homicide, I think that the data are pretty clear and, uh, and pretty much every medieval historian agrees that, uh, that, that those times were far more violent than, than the present. Um, the, uh, and then the abolition of uh, barbaric practices like uh, mm -hmm. disemboweling people who criticize the king and, and uh, burning heretics at the stake, you know, that, that's pretty um, well established as well. There are uh, people who will dispute the claim that, that uh, slavery is, uh, has been abolished because of the existence of human trafficking. But, uh, but I think that's just statistically uh, illiterate. They, even the uh, world's foremost activist for uh, eliminating the, the remaining traces of slavery, Kevin Bales, insists that uh, we've never had a period in history in which a, f a smaller proportion of the world's population has been enslaved or in which it's, it's as universally decried. Uh, the fragile um, uh, claim is certainly the um, what I call the new peace, the fact that uh -huh. since uh, around 1990, the rate of death from uh, wars all over the world, from civil wars, from insurrections, uh, ha has been uh, going down. And that is, uh, it, it's more fragile because as we see in Syria, as we see in, in uh, Congo, Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, things can get worse more easily than, say, anyone would introduce a bill in, in Congress you know, re-legalizing slavery, uh, or uh, or we'd go back up to back to the Middle Ages where people would cut off each other's noses in the middle in, in an argument. Um, so, uh, or we'd throw virgins into volcanoes. I don't think I, I think it's pretty safe to say that we're not going to do that. But could uh, things get worse in, in the Congo? Yeah, they could get worse. Yeah. And right, you, 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 your main view wouldn't be entirely falsified if you know Iran nukes Israel, and then all of a sudden there's a full-blown war. There's a, that's that's in some way a different sort of counterexample than all of a sudden America decides to throw virgins into the fire. <laughs> yes, right. the, the, the second is very unlikely because your psychological claim is pretty strong. We have a different attitude towards certain things. 
while war is something where um, the, the activity of war is more tenuously connected to our psychologies and, and it could erupt even if you're right in, in, in the main. Um, let, me, let me ask about, about two cases. One is to go back to animals, which is mm -hmm. I'm actually convinced that our sentiments towards animals, towards non-human animals, are nicer than they've ever been. Um, there are, you know, vegetarians, people care about factory farming and so on. But there, I think because of the technology, and because the technology is to some extent sequestered from the rest of our lives, the situation for non-human animals has gotten, has, has not, enti maybe it's getting better now, but over the scope of human history has not been improving. To put it another way, you often give a statistical argument of sort, would you rather be a human now or a human in, in the 1500s or a human in 1000 BC? And if I would be a pig or a cow or a chicken, I would probably rather be one in the year 1000 than the year now. Not because people are crueler now, but because now we have millions of animals being treated through factory farming. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a that, that's an excellent point. And the uh, um, in in relating statistics of harm to uh, attitudes and norms, in general, they track each other. But this right. is probably a case in which they don't. So, for example, the uh, uh, you know you could go to the movies and watch all of this simulated violence, people getting shot and blown up, and then at the end of the movie it says uh, yes. uh, no animals were harmed in the making of this motion right. picture, uh, you know, even if, if tens of thousands of uh, virtual people were. Uh, so that, that advertises a particular uh, widely held sentiment, but you're right, we don't inquire too closely into where our chicken McNuggets came from. And, and part of it, uh, of the, the the non-moral cause of the increase in uh, the number of, uh, of, of animals who've suffered is what's sometimes called the broiler chicken revolution, <laughs> namely that um, starting in the 1960s, uh, people turned from uh, beef to chicken because they first of all thought it was healthier and also people have this vague and probably unjustified sense that, that, that chickens are somehow less conscious than, than cows. Uh, but it takes 200 chickens to provide the same amount of meat as one cow. And so when you, you never think of it this way, but when you switch from hamburger to chicken, you're multiplying by 200 the number of sentient beings that are brought into existence and live an unhappy life. Uh, but, uh, and I think that, that has been one of the drivers, despite the fact that, that um, regulations to improve the fate of animals and vegetarianism and uh, it, and uh, laboratory regulations for the safeguarding of animals have all been increasing, even if, as That's you right. say, you know, probably more they're more miserable chickens now than they used to be. Um, the, so the second case study I was thinking about uh, is America and violence in America. So you present a lot of evidence that violence in America since the founding of America has dropped into a staggering to a staggering degree. But if you compare us now to, say, 1850 or 1900, um, by some statistics, our, our amount to say homicide has gone up. I mean, it's gone up and down and, and, and varies, but according to something I read from the Department of Justice, there was about one homicide per 100,000 people in the 1900s, and right now there is about four. And we're doing pretty well relative to where we were 20 years ago. But what we haven't seen is a drop. So, so why, and, and, and we're, we're above, of course, or sorry, we're worse than European countries in the extent of our violence. So what's wrong with us? Why have we been yes. immune to these processes? Right. Well, if you, um, the problem with, one of the problems with the statistics in the United States is they just don't go back very far because the mm -hmm. federal, until the 30s, the uh, federal government didn't keep homicide statistics. It was uh, up to the states and many of them mm -hmm. were pretty slapdash about the records. So the, even around 1900, I think now criminologists tend to adjust those records uh, up by, by a lot. So I think they're, they're oh, okay. never as low as one. Although you're right, they were certainly not much uh, higher, if at all, than they are today. And so over the course of the 20th century, there, there were so many uh, zigs and zags up and down that one couldn't say that there was a decline over the course of the 20th century. Um, there was a decline, if you go back to the earliest records of homicide in different parts of the United States, which you have to do because right. the country was settled so uh, heterogeneously. And then here I rely on records from uh, Randolph Roth from his book American Homicide. The earliest records in every place show uh, rates of homicide uh, 
uh, at least 10 times higher than what, than, uh, than, than what we find today. Uh, that is New England before in colonial times, um, the uh, Virginia and the coastal south, then the um, mountainous south, the kind of uh, Appalachia and hillbilly country, Texas, uh, later still Arizona and New Mexico, uh, the ranching areas of California, all in, in the earliest points at which data exists, they are all sky high. And they come down, uh, although not to the levels of civilized places like, uh, like Europe, uh, where they are in the neighborhood of one to two to per hundred thousand per year. In the U.S., they came down from the hundreds down to between five and 15, and that's where they've kind of bounced around. And so the question is, what is what's yeah. different about the U.S.? Uh, and um, uh, it, partly you have to disaggregate the United States because the South is much more violent than the North, South and Southwest, than the, the North and the coasts. And uh, there's also a, a black-white gap, which is independent of the North-South gap. And I, I think part of it, the, the, large, the simplest answer is that until recently, a lot of the United States was still in a state of uh, anarchy. And uh, because the U.S. is a democracy, once, uh, as soon as government came, people who had already cultivated a culture, a sense of honor and a right to self-defense, they kind of had to, living in anarchy. Well, once government came around, they were mm -hmm. wanted to reserve to themselves the right of self-defense instead of uh, outsourcing it to the government. And when you have individuals being their own judge, jury, and executioner, you're bound to have higher rates of violence than if you have a disinterested third party, namely the government. In Europe, the government pretty much uh, pacified and brutalized the people, and then the people made it uh, democratic, by which time they'd gotten used to the idea that the government protects them. But in the U.S., we were more or less democratic from the start, and our Mm -hmm. Cultural adaptation to anarchy is something that, at least in the South and West, people weren't willing to, to give up. Well, put it this way. If you look at the last 100 years, so you look at the data you report in your book, uh, you look at either the United States as a whole or you look at, say, cities like Boston or New York, or I've looked at New Haven where I live, um, what you see is a very recent decline, but, but the overall graph isn't one of a line going down. It's of a zigzag. It shoots up in the late 60s. It goes down. It goes up. And... Maybe I could ask a question about, about your projection. We've seen a recent decline in violence over the last 10, 20 years. Um, do you see this as just another zigzag that's just another random moving up and down? Or do you see this as a beginning of a trend that will bring us down to European levels? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, the other possibility is that it will kind of hover in between at mm -hmm. the level that we have now, never quite getting down to uh, you know, Iceland or Denmark. Uh, but better than it was in the <clears throat> battle days of the 70s and the 80s when you had <clears throat> Escape from New York and the Warriors and uh, Hill Street yeah. Blues and all of those uh, 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 shows in which ever-present violence was a backdrop. We, we both spent those years in Canada, so we saw that. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, so we escaped the worst of it, it's true. Uh, I doubt that it'll go back up to what it was in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, namely uh, 10 per 100,000 per year. Now it's between 4 and 5 per 100,000 per year. Mm -hmm. Partly because in those, at that time, when it looked like everything had spun out of control and people had lost the confidence that there was anything you could do about street crime. It was just, it was considered intractable that until you eliminated poverty and racism, and you know, who knows when that'll be, you just have yeah. to live with, with high levels of crime. Uh, then, starting in the 90s, the, crime, the violent crime rate plummeted, and uh, it probably wasn't because racism and inequality vanished, uh, but it was things probably like better policing and uh, police working in more consultation with local communities. Uh, certainly, incarceration must have had something to do with it, just yeah. physically removing crime-prone people from the streets, uh, even if it went way, way, way overboard. And, and uh, I don't think people are going to uh, be willing to sl slide back into the high rates of crime of, of the 70s and 80s now that they know that it's no longer necessary. Uh, now, we're living with a, an unfortunate side effect of that, namely over-incarceration. But uh, what I don't think will happen is that 
people will, will go back to the days when you couldn't walk in Times Square or Central Park. Yeah. Though I, I guess in some way uh, that's a different sort of potential counterexample, which is to the extent unjust incarceration is a form of violence, and I think you would agree that it is, that has gone up in recent years. In the United States, yes. So yeah, in the United States and Russia, I guess, and some other countries. Yeah, so you know, some of it was a response to the uh, increase in uh, crime in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And so there's a, there, part of that rise has made other people uh, safer from, from violence. Women can walk in the streets and, and, and be much less likely to be raped. The, the rate of rape is, has fallen by about 80% since the 1970s. And part of that explanation is that rapists have been put behind bars, so it's one uh, kind of violence preventing another. Uh, but it's also mm -hmm. clear that the U.S. has gone way overboard and that there are drug dealers and, uh, and petty criminals that also get thrown, thrown in jail, too. So in that sense, there has been a, uh, a reversal, because that surely is a kind of violence. So now, now we're sort of starting to shift to the second half of your book, which... Um which is, is more psychology, less history, less political science. I think it's, just, it's, it's fascinating in many ways where you argue, you talk about the mechanisms that have led to the decline of violence. And, and one of the many interesting things about the discussion is it's not a not what you think they are, which is if someone had asked me, I would have assumed that, uh, that violence will drop when poverty, as poverty drops, as um, income difference drops and other things. But you, you point to other factors, and I wondered if you could talk briefly about that. Uh, yes, and that uh, many criminologists say that the big lesson from the great American crime decline starting in 1992 is that you don't have to have a revolution in um, uh, wealth distribution and social arrangements for crime itself to drop. That crime can be a localized problem that can be addressed with better policing and, and, uh, and other measures. Uh, yeah, so I think the... Um, uh, among the gen generic causes, one, ones that I would apply in different measure to, to the, the six different declines that I uh, try to document. Mm -hmm. uh, psychologically, one of them is uh, increased exercise of the faculty of self-control. That is, you just, uh, you, know, you still have the impulse to throttle someone, but you count to ten and you, you, you stifle it. And that, I think, can be a downstream consequence of more effective law enforcement. But it also probably comes from um, a general sense that the, that the social order is legitimate. Because it's not as if we have you know, police snipers on every rooftop or, or you know, Big Brother watching us all the time. Some of the inhibition from violence has to be purely internal. So it has to be some kind of knock-on consequence from... Uh, uh, imposition of law and order, including perhaps the the confidence that your the other guy is also being deterred by the Leviathan, and so you don't have right. to be um, uh, pr constantly prove that you are so mean and tough that other people won't mess with you. Uh, another uh, psychological faculty that, that I think has been increasingly engaged is is uh, empathy. That uh, as the world becomes more cosmopolitan, as we experience life through the eyes of other people, it's a little harder to dehumanize and demonize them, and, and maybe you lose your taste for, for genocide and uh, grisly torture when you imagine that other people have minds like yours. Uh, and um, uh, I, I think there's been an expansion of reason, something that, that, uh, that you've written about with, uh, with David Pizarro and uh, on your own, that, that um, there's certain moral arguments that become overwhelming and that people accept as uh, and, and eventually become second nature, but after they have been forced to confront them with their cognitive processes. And the expansion of literacy, schooling, uh, dissemination of history, of uh, news, uh, it, it changes people's belief in terms of what's justified and what isn't. And it reframes violence from uh, a contest that you have to win to a problem that afflicts everyone that you try to solve. I, I guess what, what I, it sounds plausible, and it, it makes me wonder about what you could call the Mad Max question. So um, there are two factors here that you talk about that reinforce one another. One is our psychologies are different. Um, we have different attitudes. Say I have different attitudes than I would have had a few hundred years ago. 
about about blacks, about gay people, about about men and women, about torturing animals. I'm far less violent in my appetites and my desires and what I'll accept. But then the second thing is I also live in a society where there's uh, leviathan, there's there's laws, there's restraints, and to some extent, these are mutually reinforcing. The fact that our psychologies work that way explains why we have the laws we do. And the fact that we have the laws we do kind of explains why our psychologies work that way. I mean, the Mad Max question is, what would we do if the society was taken away from us? What if we do, if I, if I look out my window, I see mushroom clouds coming from, you know, New York and Washington, and then our society collapses. How robust do you think our enhanced moral psychologies will be in the absence of external controls. Okay, very good. Yeah, so you and I are Montrealers and we both grew up proud of our low rate of violence. And the question is, was it because Montrealers are more polite and civilized or is it also because we knew that the police were watching our back? Well, another trait of life in Quebec is that the public service uh, unions periodically go on strike. Uh, including um, the police one day in 1969, and uh, that kind of gives you gives you a kind of controlled experiment. And sad to say, for the reputation of Montrealers, within a, a few hours there was widespread lo looting and rioting and vandalism, and not one but two homicides within a span of a few hours before the Mounties were brought in to, <laughs> to restore order. Okay. So that part of the, we, we lived through a bit of, of Mad Max. Uh, whether we would go back to throwing virgins into volcanoes or burning heretics at the stake, that I, I, I doubt. But in terms of street crime, uh, I, I think there is some fragility there. You, you might be right, though, there's a, maybe a rosier view, which is that there's tremendous human difference and there is some percentage of people, say psychopaths, for instance, are just, you know, really bad people. And they, they need the police. They, they, they are restrained only by the police. They are restrained only at the idea of being caught and being arrested. And um, I, I guess what the statistic one would want to know for something like the Montreal case is, did incidents of domestic violence, say, go up across the board? Or, or were these actions committed by a small minority of people who were delighted the police were no longer on their job? Yes, I, I, I suspect that it was the latter, although there can be some um, spiraling of positive feedback loop because there are yes. probably other people who are not uh, inherently violent but will rise to the occasion if they think they're living in a violent environment and that they're only... Um, uh, option for safety is to you know, do it to them before they do it to you, to be uh, prepared to retaliate, to prove to others that you're tough enough that you will retaliate. Those are things that people who aren't psychopaths might have to cultivate in an environment that has a lot of psychopaths, or at least a lot of psychopaths that are uh, undeterred by the police. Right. So if the psychopaths start getting their way, um, they'll diminish the morality of the rest of us who have to contend with them. And then, and then things will spiral downwards. Exactly. And I think that's why uh, all, a number of violent statistics seem so chaotic and hard to predict. They kind of go up and down when everyone least expects them to. Uh, no one predicted the 1960s crime boom. Um, there was uh, economic expansion. There was expansion of civil rights. There was um, uh, much less inequality than we have now, but crime went through the roof. And then in the 1990s, every expert predicted that it would get even worse, and it, yeah. it, uh, the bottom fell out. And uh, you know, I wonder if some of the, the trends, both up and down, that no one could explain, come from this self-reinforcing dynamic of violence. Yeah. Um, so there's the Leviathan, there's, there's custom. There's, so you, you talked about empathy, and, and one of the things that was... Uh, you, you argue, and I think, I think it's convincing that uh, empathy plays a huge role in the expansion of, our, of the moral circle, expansion of concern, and consequently the decline of violence. But you're actually skeptical about empathy. And, and I, I, since I am too, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's not comfortable to be against empathy. It's kind of like being against love or, or motherhood. But, uh, but empathy can only go so far. And there is a passage from Adam Smith's theory of the moral sentiments that, that both of us have uh, savored. Yeah. 
and I know uh, from prior conversations that this is one of your favorite books as well. But he, he gives a, a thought experiment, almost a modern version of a trolley, uh, earlier version of a trolley problem, mm -hmm. where to, to illustrate the limits of empathy and compassion as forces for moral progress that I, I think is brilliant. He starts off by saying, imagine you read of, uh, in the paper of some disaster, uh, say a million people were killed in an earthquake in China. You know, be honest, how would you react? Uh, you, you know, you'd be upset, you'd, you'd fret, you'd reflect on the fragility of, uh, of, of human life. And then, you know, you'd probably put the paper down and have, have dinner and, you know, check your email, watch TV, and, uh, you know, it wouldn't really affect you that much. He was saying you're... You, you would sleep soundly that night. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yes, as if nothing had happened. Yeah. Whereas if you were in an accident and, and your hand got mangled and your little finger had to be amputated, you probably wouldn't be able to get it out of your mind. So that makes a sound, you know, that, that sounds like a very dark and uh, cynical picture of, of humanity. But he continues and he says, well, let, let's change the comparison now. now. Now it becomes a trolley problem. Let's say you had the choice between having your little finger cut off or a million people in China die. What would you choose? And he predicts, and uh, someone, someone should do this experiment, maybe, yeah. <laughs> because uh, I'm speculating on the answer, as he did, that that no decent person would favor their little finger over a million Chinese, even if the loss of a little finger causes more emotional distress than the loss of a million Chinese. That suggests that some power of reason, that is, can, when we have to justify a choice, what choice do we make, has to be potent in, uh, in, in human affairs. It seems right. It seems the proximate psychological mechanisms that go on in that intuition, which is, I think, pretty strong, um, are interesting. You, you could imagine that people are simply driven to that feeling that they shouldn't make this, they should sacrifice the little finger um, based on some pure exercise of reason. I think, and I think Smith talks a little bit about this, there's probably the emotions are maybe that of shame or guilt or anticipated guilt. He talks about the impartial spectator, and he uses the term in different ways, but when I imagine being faced to make that decision and imagine the idea of choosing to save my finger and kill millions of people, I, I, I see other people. I, I would feel yeah. ashamed to do that. Um, and, and, and I would feel ashamed even if nobody knew because in some way, one thing that reason gives us is a little person in our head judging our consequences from an objective point of view. Yes, the, the inhabitant of the breast, he called it, yes. in the flowery uh, language of the 18th century. But yes, and it, I guess the question is, does that person have to, do, do we have to worry that there's a real person who will find out what our choice is, or does the, uh, the, the, the homunculus, the inhabitant of the breast, uh, suffice? Uh, and, you know, that might vary from one person to another, but it's certainly a, a, a capability that we all have to, even if we know that no one will find out, to act as if uh, someone might find out. Uh, that's right. I mean, uh, so, so the, uh, another sort of limitation of empathy, so empathy won't get you there. Another limitation of empathy is that it drives us to do some, some more response at the expense of others. Um, Dan Batson has an experiment where he talks about... Uh, a girl and she's in line to get some sort of organ transplant that will save her life. And when you get people to be empathetic towards her, they agree to move her up ahead of everybody else. But of course that's wrong. There's a fair procedure in place and, and you're being biased for one person over another. And empathy, when, I think when it comes to certain decisions of statistical consequence and global consequence, really something like global warming, empathy fails us. <laughs> yeah, that's and, true. And, you know, yeah. It, it, it's hard. It's hard to drive an emotional response about global warming. You know, you talk about penguins or something, but but if you if you said, look, in order to have a carbon tax, it's going to put some poor guy out of his job. I can imagine what it's like to be some poor guy. Um, I can't imagine what it's like I, the, the the consequences of global warming, since they're in the future and they're abstract and they're statistical, are much harder to resonate with. Yes, I mean, that you, you have to visualize some Bangladeshi with his uh, farm under six inches of salt water uh, 50 years from now, which is uh, harder to do than the guy next door who's going to lose his job in the, in the uh, coal mine. It's true. And uh, another example is um, one of the forces that saps uh, vibrant societies all over the world, namely corruption. <clears throat> well, the, 
the term corruption and the, the, the mental model of, uh, of an impurity or damage kind of hides the fact that what corruption really is at the psychological level is being nice to your friends and, and relatives. Uh, you, you give your knucklehead nephew the job instead of some stranger, or you, yeah. you pay a, a fave someone's been nice to you, so you reward him with a, a perk or a job. Uh, we have the, the, the psychologically unnatural policy of fiduciary rules and formal regulations. You have to you know, advertise for a job, hire the best possible candidate, yep. even if they've never been nice to you. Uh, that's, we now know abstractly at a cognitive level that, that that's necessary for societies to flourish, but it means turning off your empathy that, uh, or, being, or forcing other people to turn off their empathy. I mean, in another case, it brings us back to animals. So, so, you know, we can imagine you and I sitting over our chicken McNuggets, you know, bemoaning how people are cruel to their dogs. And because dogs elicit empathy, but chickens typically don't. And, and so, so we could be horrifically brutal to all sorts of creatures, but not the cute ones. No one's going to eat a panda. But, you know, <laughs> right. but, but, but we're fine with pigs and cows and so on. And, and so the morality that ends up with an empathy-only policy is, is, I think, you know, horribly skewed. Uh, I mean, this gets us into moral psychology more generally, which is a, a field that you've contributed a lot to. And one thing which I've, I've wrestled with, and I'm curious what your view is, do you think that the sort of work we do as psychologists, um, studying the grounds of moral decision-making and so on, could have normative consequences? So it could not only tell us, everybody agrees we could figure out with luck what's going on when people make moral decisions, but do you think our work could tell us what moral decisions we should make, what's right and what's wrong? Uh, you know, not not mechanically, but uh, but I, I would tend to think they are relevant. And one example is, uh, when do you discount some deeply held um, uh, conviction that might be explicable by quirks of our evolved psychology, but that ought to be given no moral weight? Uh, my colleague Josh Green has argued that some intuitions that motivate uh, you, um, uh, deontological uh, uh, conclusions in, in moral dilemmas, um, like sacrificing one person to save five if you do it with your bare hands, but not if you do uh -huh. it indirectly, might be a, a case where our moral intuitions are warped by, uh, by by some kind of evolved psychology, and there may be other cases like that. So we both have domains we've worked on, which I think fall into that category. I've always been interested in disgust um, and arguing that the evolutionary history of disgust, as well as its actual actual history in human in, in over over human society, suggests it's a very unreliable moral guide, and we should reject it. You actually have have written uh, I, I quite an article which got some strong responses in the New Republic on dignity. Where oh you yes, argue right. That dignity is a moral mistake, and and so since we're against you know motherhood and empathy, why don't you take a shot at dignity and say what's wrong with that? Yes, and uh, I was asked to testify before uh, George W. Bush's um, Presidential Council on Bioethics, which was um, stacked with people who wanted to use a concept of dignity to, um, to, to motivate the um, banning or the restriction of research that would seem to make everyone better off on uh, uh, utilitarian considerations. Stem cell research using embryonic stem cells would be an example. Uh, and, and others might be uh, manipulations to enhance cognition and personality, uh, measures that might extend life. Uh, you, your first reaction would be, well, who could possibly be against those? If, every, if a number of people are better off and no one's worse off, what grounds could there be for opposing them? And the idea on this council was that uh, you should oppose them because they might be affronts to human dignity. Mm -hmm. uh, an example might be if you grew human organs in, in a dish, or an ultimate sci-fi scenario. What if you could somehow grow uh, entire bodies without brains to supply you with, a, with, with uh, replaceable organs, and no one was suffering, but uh, would, there be, would that be an affront to dignity and therefore something you would oppose even if it helped people and didn't hurt anyone? Uh, and you know, my, my response is that uh, dignity conceived of as um, just a, a reaction that we have to, to certain states of affairs shouldn't be given a whole lot of weight. It, not that it should be given zero weight, but we already undergo many compromises to dignity. Uh, certainly when we, we allow ourselves to be you know, probed by a, a doctor with a 
you know, rubber glove on it, you know, over his digits. Uh, when we put on those silly hospital johnnies, uh, when we allow Homeland Security to slide a, a wand up our crotch, uh, we, dignity is a fine thing, but we're, we often sacrifice it for, for greater goods. Uh, it can even be overused as when people preserve their authority by uh, maintaining an aura of dignity, and a lot of political satire is deliberately designed to puncture mm -hmm. dignity. So dignity, I argue, should not be sacrosanct. It is a, a, uh, it's not something that we should completely blow off, because basically the psychological response of dignity is triggered by certain perceptual cues like composure, maturity, um, cleanliness, propriety, and in turn it, it, it triggers a, a, a um, response to, to respect and safeguard the interests of that person. So that's not something you want to toss out the window because it can engage our psychology to get one person to respect another. And uh, on the other hand, it is a psychological response. And if it's a question of compromising our dignity, but making people uh, live longer and healthier, then to, to hell with dignity, or so I argued. I, I find that convincing, but there's, I think there are harder cases for that view. So I'm thinking about cases which are often used to argue against certain utilitarian perspectives. So um, suppose we're in a situation where the poor people of the world would agree to um, sell their organs or sell themselves into slavery uh, to the rich people of the world. And the rich people are happy with this, and the poor people actually will voluntarily choose to do this. They're not coerced. Um, still, I think that there's some validity to intuition that this is a bad state of affairs because we are stripping people of their dignity in part. Do you find it all convincing? Well, not the slavery part, because you are, uh, there, there's a, a greater principle that uh, may render dignity uh, irrelevant, which is autonomy. Uh, if you give people informed consent uh, over things that affect them, that kind of wipes away a lot of the, the problematic cases that have been ascribed to violations of dignity. And that would certainly uh, subsume the uh, selling yourself into slavery, which by definition means that you permanently surrender autonomy, which you can never exercise again. And so it's, it's self-contradictory in this kind of thought experiment. A bit more troubling would be, say, this, the, the, the voluntary sale of, uh, of kidneys, uh, for example, where there, um, you know, uh, on the whole, I think I'm not opposed to it, but I can imagine it... Uh, in more extreme cases where you might want to um, put in universal restrictions on people's autonomy for some kind of greater good. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I, I, I actually agree with that case. I, I would be in favor of a regulated market in kidneys. I think the benefits would be, would be huge. But I'm also sort of sensitive to risk, and there's something, there's something disturbing about it, and I'm not sure whether my, my disturbing feel is something I should, as a psychologist, as a consistent psychologist, dismiss as a form of irrationality or try to look deeper into it. Um, I, I, I take it, I take it, you never come out and say this, but I take it by the end of the book when you're talking about decline of violence and other different moral systems, that, that you and Anne are uh, consequentialists? Yeah, um, except insofar as there might be general universal principles that are ultimately um, uh, beneficial in their consequences. But, uh, and I suppose that, I, I guess in the jargon, that would be kind of rule utilitarian yeah. instead of act utilitarian. But yeah, if there was some principle that didn't um, in the long run and when uh, followed by everyone had no beneficial consequences for human welfare, I don't think I would sign on to it. And I think that sometimes when de being a good deontologist might yield yeah the greatest utilitarian benefits over the long term. Uh, right. So, so, so the sort of cases are, you know, we might, as a consequentialist, might say torture is sometimes the right thing to do because the life saved or outbalanced the pain that's caused. But you, but you might also say consistently you should have an absolute rule saying no torture because we're just better off consequences-wise with that absolute rule, though in specific cases it might lead to less optimal consequences. Yeah, that kind, of, that, 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 uh, uh, that kind of argument, exactly. I just wanted to end by sort of getting to a couple of broader things. I mean, one broader thing is what, what strikes me as interesting and different in the way things were 10 years ago, 
is that the sort of discussions we're having now about violence, about evolution, about human nature, about morality, have this sort of very broad public nature where there's a lot of very talented science writers and maybe some less talented science writers <laughs> writing about this. Everything's on, you know, we're, we're doing this, right? Maybe self-referential, but we have, you know, blogging heads and all these things that weren't available. Do you think this is mostly to the good? I mean, uh, I, I can point out specific instances where it's not to the good, where things get corrupted, um, where there's pressure for psychologists and other scientists to come out with pithy, um, dramatic findings, which may not be true, um, in order to, to please their, the Twitterverse. Mm -hmm. But I also see positive things. I'm, I'm curious where you stand on this. Yeah, on the whole, I would uh, I would agree that it, that it is uh, positive. But I think a more psychologically self-aware uh, society is one that's better off. That is that we, uh, if we get in the habit of um, questioning our own convictions, our own reactions, our gut feelings, uh, I think that's to the good because, uh, at, and at, at a variety of scales, like the thirst for retribution in the judicial system, is it really, uh, when we throw all those people in jail, how much of that lowers the crime rate and how much of it is we just have a gut feeling that they ought to be punished. Uh, if, we, if our nation is, is insulted and we itch to go to war, how much of that is testosterone? Uh, poisoning and, and how much of it is rationally justifiable. We, and I, I tend to think that some of the change in sensibilities of, of the post-war period is the fact that we're living in an age of psychology where we have concepts like testosterone poisoning and uh, alpha males and, and, and uh, uh, pissing contests and so on, which kind of gives us a whole category to explain away a lot of behavior that in earlier times might have been seen as manly honor and dignity and just self-evidently correct. Uh, and there may be uh, other examples where we, we're being, the, the, the dissemination and proliferation of psychology might encourage self-reflection that might bubble up to decision makers and, and uh, leave us better off because we have to justify what we do instead of uh, acting on instinct. That's interesting because it's a sort of unfashionable sentiment. There's a lot of people who complain that the normal language of morality and responsibility and blame has been, you know, replaced, at least in certain public forums, with the language of neuroscience and psychology, where, you know, we no longer talk about, about this, you know, about minds and decisions. We talk about neurons firing and neural networks and parts of the brain and so on. And I think a lot of people worry that this is actually a bad thing in the main because um, it, among other things, diminishes uh, the sort of, to the extent we have a spiritual or transcendent value, it takes away from it. Mm, yes, there's, well, there's the practical concern that, of uh, what uh, Dan Dennett calls creeping exculpation. No yeah. one is guilty of, of anything because it's their, their genes, it's the Twinkies they ate, it's the, uh, the testosterone, it's a, uh, there's a pixel in a brain scan. But in practice, you don't really see a huge numbers of people going free because of Twinkie defenses and uh, sure. fMRI excuses. Uh, if anything, we've got, we're living through this incarceration boom. So that's a fear that does not seem to, uh, I mean, the, uh, uh, an event that hasn't materialized. Okay. Um, and I should just end by asking you if you could just very briefly talk about your, your next book. Oh, yes. Uh, and now for something completely different. Yeah, this is different. <laughs> I tend to uh, alternate books on language with, uh, again, the, the, the field that both you and I have started off specializing in, with books on, on human nature more broadly conceived. And so I'm due for another book on language, and this one's going to be a style manual. That is, uh, can we take what we like to think we've learned about how language works and how the mind works, and translate that into better advice for, for how to write well, how to avoid academies and bureaucraties and legalese, how to write more gracefully and uh, clearly, respecting the cognitive processes of readers who've got to digest your prose. Uh, awesome. So it would just be the sort of book that, that you know, if, if prior to me writing my next book, I wanted to write like you or just write, write well, I pick it up. We could use it as, as something, as a practical guide. Well, you're the last person who would need it, but there, uh, so there are many of our, 
colleagues who will remain unnamed for good use. <laughs> so uh, they not just you. send it out anonymously. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Not to make any hints, but uh, you know, a okay. good Christmas present for, for some people. Well, after, now that we're starting to diss our colleagues, we should uh, we should bring this to an end. Thanks a lot for uh, for talking with me. It's my pleasure, Paul. Thanks so much for having me on. Bye.